Chapter Fourteen of Curiosities of Olden Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in November two thousand and twelve. Curiosities of Olden Times by Sabine Baring Gould. Chapter Fourteen: A Mysterious Veil. In the Gretla, an Icelandic saga of the 13th century, is an account of the discovery of a remarkable valley buried among glacier-laden mountains, by the hero, a certain Grettir, son of Asmund, who lived in the beginning of the 11th century. Grettir was outlawed for having set fire, accidentally, to a house in Norway, in which were at the time the sons of an Icelandic chief, too drunk to escape from the flames. He spent nineteen years in outlawry, hunted from place to place, with a price on his head. The saga relating his life is one of the most interesting and touching of all the ancient Icelandic histories. In the year 1025, Grettir was in such danger that he was obliged to seek out some unknown place in which to hide. In the words of the saga, About autumn Grettir went up into Geitland and waited there till the weather was clear. Then he ascended the Geitland glacier and struck southeast over the ice, carrying with him a kettle and some firewood. It is supposed that Halmund, another outlaw, had given him directions, for Halmund knew much about this part of the country. Grettir walked on till he found a dale lying among the snow ranges, very long and rather narrow, and shut in by glacier mountains on all sides, so that they towered over the dale. He descended at a place where there were pleasant grassy slopes and shrubs. There were warm springs there, and he supposed that the volcanic heat prevented the valley from being closed in with glaciers. A little river flowed through the dale, and on both banks there was smooth grassy meadowland. The sunshine did not last long in the valley. It was full of sheep without number, and they looked in better condition and fatter than any he had seen before. Grettir now set to work, and built himself a hut with such wood as he could procure. He ate of the sheep, and found that one of these was better than two of such as were to be found elsewhere. A ewe of mottled fleece was there with her lamb, the size of which surprised him. He fattened the lamb and slaughtered it, and it yielded forty pounds of meat, the best he had tasted. And when the ewe missed her lamb, she went up every night to Grettir's hut and bleated, so that he could get no sleep and it distressed Grettir that he had killed her lamb because she troubled him so much. Every evening, towards dusk, he heard a lure up in the dale, and at the sound all the sheep hurried away towards the same spot. Grettir used to declare that a blending, a changeling, or one who is half troll, half human, a thurs named Thorir, possessed the dale, and that it was with his consent that Grettir lived there. Grettir called the dale after him, Thorir's dale. Thorir had two daughters, according to his report, and Grettir entertained himself with their society. They were all glad of his company, as visitors were scarce there. When Lent came on, Grettir determined to eat mutton fat and liver during the long fast. There happened nothing deserving of record during the winter. But the place was so dull that Grettir could endure it no longer, so he went south over the glacier range and came north over against the midst of Skjaldbreid. There he set up a flat stone and knocked a hole through it, and was wont to say that, if any one looked through the hole in the slab, he would be able to distinguish the place where the gill ran out of Thoria's dale. It is surprising that this account should not have stirred up the interest and curiosity of the natives to rediscover the rich valley, but we know of only two such attempts having been made, one by Messrs. Olafsen and Povelsen at the close of the last century, which was unsuccessful, 
and another made in sixteen fifty four by Bjorn and Helgi, two Icelandic clergymen, an account of which is found among the Icelandic MSS in the British Museum, and which has been kindly communicated to the writer of this paper by a native of the island, now in London. This account is of exceeding interest. It corroborates the description in the Gretla in several points, and opens a field for exploration and adventure to members of the Alpine Club, more novel than the glacier world of Switzerland, and not less interesting to science. The writer, who visited Iceland in 1862, purposed exploring this mysterious valley from the south, but was unable to find grass for his horses within a day's ride of the glaciers, and was obliged to relinquish his attempt. Had he then seen the account of the visit of Björn and Helgi to the valley, he would have attempted to reach it from the north. In order that the position of this valley and the course pursued by its explorers may be understood, it will be necessary briefly to describe the glacier system in the midst of which it is situated. Langjökull is an immense waste of snow-covered mountain, extending about 43 miles from northeast to southwest, of breadth varying between 8 and 12 miles. The mass rises into points of greater elevation along the edge than, apparently, towards the centre, and these mountains go by the names of Baljökull, Geitlandsjökull, Skjaldbreidjökull, Blafeldjökull, and Hrutafeld. Skjaldbreidjökull is opposite the volcanic dome of Skjaldbreid, an extinct volcano, with its base steeped in a sea of lava. Due east of Geitlandsjökull is another glacier-crowned dome, called Ok, from which it is cut off by a trench of desolate ruined rock filled with the rubbish brought down by the avalanches on either side, a rift between black walls of trap crowned with green precipices of ice, which are constantly sliding over the rocky edges and falling with a crash into the valley. This valley is called Kaldidalr, or the cold dale a title it well deserves those who traverse it from the south encamp at a little patch of turf around some springs at the foot of skaldbreid brunir by name and thence have twelve hours hard riding before they see grass again on the hvita north of ok Halfway through this allée blanche is a mountain of trachyte, which has been protruded through the trap, from which it is clearly distinguishable by its silvery-grey and ruddy-streaked precipices, so different in colour from the purple-black of the trap. This mountain is called Thorir's Head, and is popularly supposed to mask the dale discovered by Grettir. The elaborate map of Iceland published by Gunnlaugsson indicates the valley as winding from opposite Skaldbreid to this point, but this is conjectural, and it will be seen by the sequel that it is inaccurate. North of Geitlandsjökull is an extraordinary dish-cover-shaped cake of ice raised on precipitous sides, called Eireksjökull, a magnificent but peculiar pile of basalt, ice and snow. Before proceeding with the narrative of Messrs. Olafsen and Povelsen, and of the two clergymen, we may observe that several circumstances tend to give a colour of probability to the account in the Gretla. In the first place, the phenomenon of the edges of the great glacier region of Yang Yökul, rising above the centre, makes it possible that towards that centre there may be a considerable depression. Next, the stone asserted to have been set up by Grettir on Skjaldbreid still stands, but has fallen out of the perpendicular, so that the hole in it does not point to any opening in the glaciers. But a little to the right appears a small ravine between piles of ice, through which runs a small river, which shortly after enters a lake, and, after having fed two other lakes, finally enters the Tunga Fjot, and flows past the geysers. And once more, throughout Iceland, the junction of the trap and trachyte is marked by boiling jetters, so that the mention of the hot springs in the Gretla is quite in accordance with what the geological structure of Thorir's head 
would lead us to expect. The suspicious portion of the account is the mention of Thorir and his daughters, but in all probability this troll was nothing more than an outlaw, like Grettir himself, and indeed Halmund, who is alluded to as having given Grettir his direction to the valley, and who was a personal friend of Grettir's and an outlaw, is called a troll in the Barda saga, which speaks of him and the Thorir of the mysterious Vale. It is a curious fact that in the southeast of the island, in the Vatna Jökull, a tract very similar in character to Lang Jökull, but on a far larger scale, is a valley full of grass and flowers and glistening birch, completely enclosed by glaciers, which sweep down on this little fairy dell from all sides, leaving only one narrow rift for the escape of the water, and as a portal to the glen. The expedition of Messrs. Olafsen and Povelsen is given in their own words. On the 9th of August we started from Reykholstal on our way to the glacier of Geitland. Our object was not so much to discover a region and inhabitants different from those we had quitted, as to observe the glacier with the most scrupulous accuracy, and thus to procure new intelligence relative to the construction of this wonderful natural edifice. The weather was fine and the sky clear, so that we had reason to expect that we should accomplish our object according to our wish. But it is necessary to state that in a short time the Yukuls attract the fogs and clouds that are near. On the 10th of August in the morning the air was calm, but the atmosphere was so loaded with mist that at times the glacier was not visible. About eleven o'clock, however, it cleared up, and we continued our journey from Kalmanstunga. The high mountains of Iceland rise in gradations, so that on approaching them you discover only the nearest elevation, or that whose summit forms the first projection. On reaching this you perceive a similar height, and so pass over successive terraces till you reach the summit. In the glaciers these projections generally commence in the highest parts, and may be discovered at a distance, because they overtop the mountains that are not themselves glacier-clad. We found that it was much farther to the Yökull than we had imagined, and at length we reached a pile of rocks which, without forming steps and gradation at the point we were ascended, were of considerable height and very steep. These rocks extend to a great distance, and appear to surround the glacier, for which perceived their continuance as far as the eye could reach. Footnote. They form a huge ancient moraine. End footnote. Between this pile of rocks and the glacier there is a small plain about a quarter of a mile in width, the soil of which is clay without pebbles and flakes of ice, because the waters which continually flow from the glacier carry them off. On ascending farther we discovered to the right a lake situated at one of the angles of the glacier, the banks of which were formed of ice, and the bed received a portion of the waters that flowed from the mountains. The water was perfectly green, a colour it acquired by the rays of light that broke against the ice. Footnote. It much resembles the beautiful Mayelen Sea, familiar to the visitor to Egishorn. End footnote. After many turnings and windings, we found a path by which we could descend with our horses into the valley. On arriving there we met with another embarrassment, as well in crossing a rivulet discharged from the lake, as in passing the muddy soil in which our horses often sank up to the chest. In some parts this soil is very dangerous to travellers, many of whom have been engulfed and have perished in it. Our object was so far attained that we were now in Geitland, but we found it a very disagreeable place. We observed a mountain peak rising above the ice, and which, as well as the other peaks, had been formed by subterranean fires. We led our horses over the masses of ice, after which we left them, and travelled the remainder of the way on foot. 
we had taken the precaution of providing ourselves with sticks armed with strong points and with a strong rope in case of either of the party falling into a crevice or sinking in the snow thus prepared we began to escalate the glacier at two o'clock in the afternoon the air was charged with dense fog covering all the mountain but hoping it would disperse we continued our difficult and dangerous route though at every instant we had to pass deep crevices one of which was an ell and a half in width and the greatest precaution was required in crossing it as we mounted higher the wind blew much stronger and drove larger flakes of snow before it fortunately we had the wind in our backs which facilitated our ascent but we met at the same time with so much loose snow that our progress was but slow hoping however that the weather would change we agreed not to return till we had gained the summit from which arose a black rock at length after two hours longer tramp we found that we could discover nothing in the distance a rampart of burnt rock of no considerable height rose above the ice and at this we paused to rest the snowflakes now obscured the air so much that we hardly knew how we should get back we examined the compass but without observing any change and we were prevented by our guides from going towards the northwest where the mountain is highest and least accessible the weather continued the same so that we found it impossible to resist the cold much longer and deemed it prudent to return although the sky was very heavy and dark we discovered on our return the entrance to a valley if the weather had been more favourable we should doubtless have had the pleasure of investigating it but we doubt whether we should have found thorius dale as we descended we found the wind in our face which threw the snow so much against us that we could not discover the traces of our ascent this expedition was frustrated by the inclemency of the weather messrs olafsen and povelsen made the mistake of starting in the morning in iceland vapours form over the mountain tops directly that the evening sun loses its power and although there is no night the air is sensibly colder after six p m they had the fine part of the day for the ascent from kalmanstunga to the snow and their journey over the glacier was at a time when they might almost have calculated on cloud and snow probably they had not seen the description of the discovery made by bjorn and helgi in sixteen fifty four they allude to the expedition of these clergymen but give one of them a wrong name and speak of their journal as vague and confused which it is not the account of the expedition of the two clergymen bjorn and helgi written in the same year that it was undertaken is now in icelandic in the british museum it is full of interest and sufficiently curious to deserve attention bjorn and helgi were brothers-in-law in the summer of sixteen fifty four they met at ness where they had some conversation about thorir's dale and helgi told his brother-in-law that he was convinced that either the valley itself or some traces of it could be seen by any one who would ascend the highest ridge of geitlandsjokull in consequence of this conversation bjorn attended by two men rode to husafell where lived his sister and brother-in-law and persuaded helgi to accompany him on the glacier husafell lies just under ok they started at an extremely early hour on saint olaf's day twenty eighth of july without mentioning their intention to any one this was on thursday they soon turned from the highway following the west side of a cleft that enters a trunk ravine near husafell and then reaching the north side of ok glacier they halted footnote the writer has been over this portion of the ground and knows the course pursued End footnote. there was a young man bjorn jonsson by name with the two clergymen a well-educated man to him they now for the first time told their purpose and they positively declared that they were determined to go at once across kaldidalr 
and thence ascend Geitland's Jökull, striking due east. His curiosity was aroused, and he agreed to go with them. They took with them also a little boy, intending, if they reached a precipice commanding the valley which they could not descend themselves, to let the boy down by a rope, that he might examine the place. They had with them a tent and provisions for several days. They now struck due east, and kept their eyes fixed on a point where they thought they could discern a black ridge of mountains on the north side of the Yukul, and a hollow on the south. Till they reached the glacier, they met with no obstacles except a stony ridge of hills, which stretches all the way from the glaciers in the east, and crosses Kaldidalr in a northern direction. On the north side of this ridge was a heap of snow, and a small lake formed by the water from the glaciers. Apparently the horses could not descend, but Björn pushed his horse down a narrow pass into a small river, flowing below the rocks. The river is very deep, but it is full of soft mud and sluggish. From the eastern bank of it, towards the glacier, is a sandy, muddy plain, here they saw a raven flying from the north side of the glacier towards Ock. It did not make any noise, but seemed to be rather startled by the sight of human beings in that solitude. After a while they lost sight of it and saw it no more. They crossed the sandy plain towards the glacier and scrambled up a spur of loose shingle, till they reached a river that burst out from beneath the ice. There the glacier became very steep, and they did not see how to take their horses farther, as on all sides were seracs of ice and fissures and crevices of immense depth. Then Björn made a vow that he would take his horse, named Skoli, over the glacier, and not leave the ice mountain except on the eastern side, provided this was not contrary to the will of God. Then Helgi made a vow that if he met with any human beings, male or female, in Thoria's dale, he would endeavour to Christianize them, and Björn promised to assist him in this to the best of his power. And they agreed to baptise immediately all the people in the valley who might be willing to embrace Christianity. They thought it prudent to leave behind them one of the horses, their baggage and the tent, at a rock near the river. On this rock they piled up three cairns as evidence that they had been there, and there also they left the boy in charge of the horse, with strict orders not to stir till their return, which would be in the night or on the following day. They took with them a bottle of corn brandy, remarking that the men of Aradalr would probably be quite ignorant of its properties. They took no weapons except small knives, and each had a spiked staff to assist him in climbing the ice. Both the clergyman and Björn Jonsson rode all the way over the glacier, and on its northern side ascended a strip of rubble as far as they could. Then they pushed the horses down on a snowdrift above the course of the river and the ravine through which it flowed. The snowbed extended over the glacier an almost interminable way due south, or perhaps a little southwest. The crust was sufficiently hard to bear up the horses. When the glacier began to rise again, it was entirely free from snow and ice, full of drifts and chasms in a direction from north to south, and as they were bearing to the east, they had to cross every one of them. Most were filled with water which overflowed the glacier, and disappeared in the snowdrift, and in some places they rode through the water on the ice. None of these rifts were too broad to be crossed in one place or another, either high up the glacier towards the south, or at its lower and north end. If they had met with a rift which they could not pass, they intended to have made a snow-bridge over it, rather than return. In this way they crossed the ice of the glacier. Next came another bed of snow, over which they rode for some while, but it was very heavy and the day was exceedingly warm and mild. When they were within a short distance of what seemed to them to be the highest point of the glacier on the east, a mist set in on both sides from the north and south, 
leaving a clear space towards the east so they could see the bright sky exactly opposite their faces and the reason of this was that the mountains rose on either side leaving a sort of depression between them along which they were going as they held on due east this was not discouraging as it showed that the mountain peaks caught the mist and left the lower ground clear at the same time they heard the rush of water beneath their feet without being able to see the stream the noise indicated a volume much larger than that which they had seen pouring through the ravine and they conjectured that the subglacial river divided into several streams before discharging itself they now passed from the snow to a gravelly soil devoid of grass it was a smooth ridge of sandstone like the bank of a mountain torrent the glaciers now sloped towards the northeast whilst some tended towards the east but right across the glaciers there lay a hollow trough and in many places along the edge black rocks shot out of the snow on the north side were lofty and craggy fells connected by snowdrifts and strips of shale and the glacier range rose considerably on the north side the party followed the sandstone ridge till it terminated abruptly in a precipice with ledges then they climbed a height and looked about them on the east of the glaciers they saw distinctly a desert track not covered with snow which they conjectured lay a straight line north of biskup's tungur sands east of the glacier were two brown fells that which was most to the south was not large and it had a castellated appearance whilst the other was oblong stretching from north to south and full of snowdrifts from the same height they saw a great valley long and narrow running in a semicircle at the end were heaps of shingle precipices and ravines the valley began about the middle of the glacier and ran northeast then bent toward the east and finally turned south towards the east the glacier became lower and in the same proportion as the mountain ranges fell did the valley become shallower but it seemed nowhere to dive to the very bottom of the mountains towards the higher end of the valley the glacier hemmed it in with steep sides where the valley was deepest the mountain slopes were bare and weather-beaten consisting of swarthy or brown terraces and hollows having a colour like that of the fell close to the southern extremity of Geitland. Footnote. It is not easy to make out what fell is meant. Possibly it may be the ridge called Thoria's head. End footnote. In some places there were dry watercourses. It was so far to the bottom of the valley that the explorers could not discover exactly where there was not grass on one of the slopes, but possibly the hue was the peculiar colour of the sandstone. Anyhow, they could not discover green pasturage. At the bottom of the valley were sandy flats, and in some places avalanches had fallen from the glaciers and strewn the ground with blocks of ice and other debris the slopes were very uneven no water or waterfalls were to be seen except two pools glittering towards the south where the valley became shallow and where it spread into gravelly plains with the glacier sliding almost to the bottom of the vale on both sides at the northeast bend of the valley were two small bare hills beneath which the explorers thought they perceived two grassy plains on both sides of a watercourse neither hot spring wood heather nor grass beside these patches were visible anywhere in one point the account of these men differs from that in the gretla for there it is stated that the valley was narrow and covered with grass but possibly the ice has encroached on the turf and destroyed it the clergymen having erected a pile of stones in memorial of their visit they went towards an immense rifted rock at the higher extremity of the valley and there discovered a cave with an opening towards the north and looking down the valley there was another opening like a window into the cavern commanding the east 
the door was exactly square and just opposite it was a big square stone this as well as the cave was of sandstone this was the only block of stone thereabouts the clergyman found that they were half the height of the cave so that it must have been from ten to twelve feet high the window on the east was oblong and they conjectured that it had been made by the wind and rain though it had possibly been the work of former inhabitants of the cave the explorers supposed that the slab opposite the door had been thrown down from above and there had originally existed no door except the rift they first discovered the rift faces the west and to enter the cave one must climb several ledges in the rock this cavern is sufficiently extensive to hold a couple of hundred persons its floor is of sand and it is well lighted through the window they did not find any antiquities but they supposed this to have been the cave occupied by thorir and his daughters the men cut their initials on the rocks Bjorn cut B S on that opposite the door, and Helgi cut a single H on the eastern wall of the cave, just below the window. Bjorn Jonsson cut his opposite, but Helgi's was the deepest engraved and will stand longest. When they had finished this, they sat down and took some refreshments, and remarked, as they drank their brandy, that this was in all probability the first time that the smell of brandy had been snuffed in that place it was now getting late however they ascended a mountain peak on the west side of the cave and separate from it by a sweep of snow and this peak they believed to be visible from kaldidalr it was very steep and difficult to climb so they rested twice on their way they went up on different sides as the clinkstone rolled away between their feet on those behind. Björn, the priest, was the first to attack the peak, but Helgi reached the summit first and found it so sharp at the top as to afford hardly enough standing ground for the three. They heaped a cairn on the top and put in it a flat stone which they placed in a vertical position and made fast with other stones in it is a small rift and they arranged it so that by placing the eye at this rift it looks eastward through the door of the cave the party then returned the same way that they had come and parted in the morning in the middle of kaldidalr bjorn going southward and helgi towards the north we think that the clergymen were mistaken in supposing that this clinkstone cone is visible from kaldidalr for we saw no appearance of it from skjaldbreid a peak is distinguishable however but more to the southwest than that described by the priests apparently three ways of entering the mysterious vale present themselves that which we ourselves intend being impractical one is to follow the route of the bold explorers bjorn and helgi a second is to camp the horses at hlitar velir grassy plains between Skjaldbreid and Hlotufell, and to follow the stream that issues from the glacier ravine into the recesses of the Jökull. A third course, and that which we expect would prove the easiest, though the least interesting, would be to encamp on the grassland around the lake Fitarvan, to the east of the Jökull, where the mountains are lower, and the existence of a large sheet of water, from which issues a considerable river, the Hvita, points to this being a place to which the drainage of a very considerable portion of the glacier converges. It is not a little remarkable that the huge extent of Lang Yökull feeds scarcely any other rivers. It is true that the Nordlinga Fjot, another Hvita and Asbranza, have their sources under the Lang Yökull, but they are only small streams, whereas the Hvita bursts out of its lake a wide and deep river, and we think that this is accounted for by the presence of a depression towards the interior of the range which gathers the drainage from the surrounding glaciers, and then pours the flood in a subglacial torrent into the lake. The opening to this valley we suppose to be blocked above the lake by the glaciers from Hrutafell and Blafeld's Jökull, which meet and overlap. 
End of chapter 14